reasoning with symbols, which this requires, this kind of reasoning requires an ingenuity to draw the right triangles, the correct triangles, I mean, to notice about the areas and to figure out how to do it. You have to be clever. But there have been improvements in the methods of analysis so that one can be quite more stupid. And I write a much faster, you're much more efficient then. And I want only to show what it looks like in the notation of the more modern mathematics where you don't do anything but write a lot of symbols to figure it out. First, we would like to talk about how fast the area changes, and we represent that by area dot. And the area changes because of a, it's, uh, when the radius is swinging, it's the component of velocity at right angles to the radius times the radius that tells how fast the area changes. So this is the component of the radial distance multiplied by the velocity or rate of change of the distance. Now the question is whether the rate of change of area itself changes. The principle is it's not supposed to change. The rate of change of area is not supposed to change. So we differentiate so-called this again, and we put, it'll mean some little trick about putting dots in the right place. <laughs> and that, that's all, you have to learn the tricks. It's, you know, I'm not, it's just a series of rules that people have found out that are very powerful for such a thing. And this says, the component of the velocity at right angles to the velocity. It is none. There is none. The velocity is in the same direction as itself. And the acceleration, which is this thing, the second derivative, or the derivative of velocity, is the force divided by the mass. So this says that the rate of change of the rate of change of the area is the component of force at right angles to the radius. But if the force is in the direction of the radius, as Newton said, then there's no force in the, at right angles to the radius, and that means that the change, rate of change of area doesn't change. I just want to illustrate the different kinds of notation. Now, Newton knew how to do this, more or less, a slight different notation, but he wrote everything this way because he tried to make it possible for people to read his papers. He invented the calculus, which is this kind of mathematics, and is a good illustration of the relation of mathematics to physics. When the problems in physics get difficult, we may often look to the mathematicians who have already studied such a thing and have reasoned about such an item before and have prepared a line of reasoning for us to follow. On the other hand, they may not have, in which case we have to invent our own line of reasoning, which we then pass back to the mathematicians, because everybody who reasons carefully about anything can re is making a contribution to the knowledge of what happens when you think about something. And if you abstract it away and send it to the Department of Mathematics, they put it in the books as a branch of mathematics. <laughs> Mathematics, then, is a way of go going from one set of statements to another. It's evidently useful in physics because we have all these different uh, ways that we can speak of things and it permits us to develop consequences and analyze the situations and re-change the laws in different ways and to connect all the various statements so that, as a matter of fact, the total amount that a physicist knows is very little. He has only to remember the rules for getting from one place to another and he's able to do that, do it then. In other words, all of the various statements about equal times, the forces in the direction of the radius, and so on, are all interconnected by reasoning. Now an interesting question comes up. Is there some pattern to it? Is there a place to begin fundamental principles and deduce the whole works? Or is there some particular pattern or order in nature in which we can understand that these are more fundamental statements and these are more consequential statements? There are two kinds of ways of looking at mathematics, which for the purpose of this lecture, I will call the Babylonian tradition and the Greek tradition. In Babylonian schools in mathematics, the student would learn something by doing a large number of examples until he caught on to the general rule. Also, a large amount of geog uh, geometry, for example, was known. A lot of properties of circles, theorem of Pythagoras, for example, uh, formulas for the areas of cubes and triangles and everything else. And some a degree of argument was available to go from one thing to another. Tables of uh, numerical quantities were available so that you could solve elaborate equations and so on. Uh, everything was prepared for calculating things out. But Euclid discovered that there was a way in which all of the theorems of geometry could be ordered from a set of axioms that were particularly simple. And you're all familiar with that much geometry, I'm sure. But the Babylonian attitude was, if I make my, my way of talking, what I call Babylonian mathematics, is that you know all these various theorems and many of the connections in between, but you've never really realized that it could all come up from a bunch of axes. 